Hello, this is Dining Table Print and Play, and today we're going to talk about making large game boxes. We've previously talked about making small game boxes, uh, little tuck boxes, small telescoping boxes and so on, which are suitable for card games and games with a small number of tokens or tiles, but today we're going to talk about making larger game boxes, and these are going to be bigger, sturdier boxes for games which have like a fold-out board or many, many decks of cards or pieces. As usual, there's multiple ways we can do this, and we're going to talk about three. There's wrapping an existing box, so you take a, in our case, an old expansion box, we're going to wrap that with print and play game graphics. We're going to talk about making a foam core box, so we construct a very sturdy and lightweight box completely from scratch out of foam core. And we're going to talk about constructing a telescoping box out of thick card entirely from scratch that's large enough to store your full-size print and play games. First of all, we're going to talk about wrapping an existing box. So in my case, I have an old expansion box, and I've since taken all of the expansion parts out of it, and they've gone on to the actual full game box. And it happens to be exactly the right size for one of my print and play games. And I've been storing it in that box, but at the moment it just looks like the expansion on the shelf and doesn't actually look like the game that it really contains. So I'm going to print out some graphics and wrap those around the outside of my expansion box so that when I look at it on the shelf, Instead of saying a starry box, it says dark star. I'll create this wrap as 10 different sections. Five for the five faces of the lid, and five for the five faces of the base. Here, I'm taking some artwork from the game, and creating a rectangular area for, in this case, the back cover, using measurements from the box itself. Next, the rectangle is positioned over the artwork and the fill removed, so I just keep the cut outline. Now I'll add some text describing the game, and add some crop marks at the corners so I can delete the rectangle itself. If I left the outline then it might show up if I don't cut it out perfectly, but I can line a rule up with the crop marks and nothing will show once it's cut out. The process is exactly the same for the front cover. In this case the game has a front cover image I can use without modification, so I'll drop that in place and size it appropriately. Next I'll create some rectangles for the short ends of the lid. Again I start off with a rectangle the same size as the face of the box, which I've measured previously. We need some flaps to wrap around the corners to create a bit of overlap to make sure there's no gaps in our design. So I'll add an 8mm flap to one edge which will wrap around to the front of the box, and a 15mm flap to the opposite edge which will wrap around inside the box. We also need a 15mm flap at each corner of the box to make sure we get a continuous image all the way around. Now I can decorate my short ends with the graphics I want on the ends of the box. Next I create a new outline, colour it in one of the darker colours from the graphics and make it very thin. Because there's several interior corners, I can't just rely on crop marks, but if I do accidentally leave some of this line when I cut it out, it won't be very visible because it's a very thin line and it's a similar colour to the box artwork. Since the box lid has two short ends, we can now duplicate all of this for the second end. Now we'll do the long sides and add a rectangle of the correct size. I'm positioning this over a copy of the short side so that I can extend both the flaps and also the background graphics to fit. Like this, the background graphics will definitely line up properly at the corners. At each corner of the box, we only need one flap to cover the corner, and I already put them on the short sides, so we don't need end flaps on the long sides. Now I'll decorate the long side panels as well. Again, we'll also need two long side panels. The process for the sides of the base is exactly the same, so I won't show it. I'm just going to use less decorative graphics, since I won't be able to see them when the box is closed. Now we've got all of that printing done. I've printed these out on photo paper, essentially. It's, it's a really nice, high quality paper, which gives a good image, because this is going to be the wrap for a really nice game that I like to keep. But it's not sticky. So next, we need to turn these into labels so that we can stick them over the outside of our box. And typically, there's more than one way we can do that as well. The first approach is to use spray glue. And for that, we're going to take one of these. This is the, is the sides. This is going to be the inside of the box. So it will be on this face. And we're going to cut these to size first, cut around the lines that we left on the template, and then spray glue the back of them and then we will lay some greaseproof baking parchment over the back of it and that will act as a sticker backing 
we can then bring it back in and peel that backing off and just the same way we would apply a normal sticker we can lay this down to the side of our box and that's a good way to create stickers out of good paper the other way we can use do is there are various machines that will do this for you i use a, a xyron creative station which will essentially apply a layer of self-adhesive glue to the back of a piece of paper for you you could of course just use full sheet label paper for this so if i have printed my my box cover here on full sheet labels i could peel off the backing and then stick it directly down onto the box in the same way as any other sticker and that's fine you can definitely do that i find that i get a better print on higher quality paper but if you either are perfectly happy with the print you get on your labels and, and some labels are super high quality and will give you a very good print or you don't want to go through all the hassle of making regular paper into print sticker paper then full sheet label paper is also an option the first thing we need to do to wrap this box is cut out these panels we're going to start with the end panels because as we mentioned earlier we need to have these tabs on the side here that will wrap around the sides wrap around the inside and wrap around the underside of this box in order that when we stick the sides and the bottom face on there's no gaps so we'll start off with these and we're going to just cut them out as close to the lines as possible Now we've got these cut out, we want to make sure that they do actually fit the box okay. So I'm going to hold them up to the side of the box and just see how tall is that compared to the, the height of the box. If they are close, or especially if when we do this, we catch the edge of the, lab the, uh, the wrap that will become a label, then it's worth trimming these at a slight angle, just angled inwards. Because like that, they won't be easy to accidentally catch with your finger and peel off at the edge of the box. So I'm just going to freehand trim a slight bevel on these. Now, the as I said before, the exact shape of these end flaps, because they're going to be covered up by the side graphics, it doesn't matter overly, but we just want to make sure they're vaguely neat. is lay down an old flyer, newspaper would do, whatever, something clean. We want to place these near enough together that we can get our bit of baking paper and it covers all of them. Because this is going to be our sticker backer. So we take our spray glue and then spray the backs. And don't forget to empty the glue afterwards. Then we take the baking parchment and lay it over the top. Flip the entire thing and start peeling back the flyer, making sure that our, our sprayed pieces lay neatly on our backing paper. Unfortunately, the glue gets down the sides a little bit and picks them up a bit, but there we go. These now work more or less like stickers. Now we quickly divide these up. Don't need to be very precise here, just as long as they're separate. Bear in mind, this won't last forever. We need to use them relatively quickly. And as you can see, it doesn't stick down to them quite so firmly as 
it would to regular sticker paper. However, it still gives us something which is a lot closer to the, the sticker experience. So we can stick these onto the end panels of our box, make sure they're the right way up. And we want to lay this in position. We want to aim for these, aim for these gaps here to be in line with the corners of the box and then stick it down, make sure we're still aligned at the other end and then start to peel the backing out from behind it keeping that other end lined up the whole time smooth that down and then we can wrap these around the corner Make sure that's nicely pressed down so that it's good and secure. Same down here, we should have no bubbles all the way down. And then we just want to fold this tab into the inside of the box. And then we flip the box over and just stick this lip down onto the back of the box. And this bit you want to make very sure that you do as, as well stuck as possible because it's not very it's not very long and it's not very long on purpose to make sure that we don't actually pop the, the back off but it does mean that you have to be very careful to make sure it's stuck down. Use a good spray glue and this is nice and firmly stuck on. So I'll just quickly do the other one. The long sides are generally easier. The trick is you need to line the graphics up with the corresponding points on the faces. So what I find easiest is to peel back the sticker at both ends, but leave it in the middle. You want at least one of these at a, an angle so that you can actually get the sticker out from underneath when you're done, okay? And then we just line this up at the end here, touch it down, on top of the existing graphic, so the graphic wraps neatly all the way around. Go right the way to the other end, make sure that's also aligned. If you do find that one of these goes too far, like this, there's a little bit sticking out, the solution is simply to get your craft knife and cut right the way down into that corner there. Now we've stuck it down, <laughs> now we've theoretically stuck it down at both ends. Firm that down at both sides. Just pull the backing paper out from behind and smooth it down all the way along. Again, you want this really, really firmly down and then wrap it around the back. And if that's gone well, you should find that between them, the corner there is completely covered up and the original graphics can't be seen any longer. You might find when you do this that this corner doesn't quite stick properly because you've got too many layers of the sticker going. If that's the case, take your knife and very lightly miter it, just cut a diagonal from the, the point where the two stickers meet on the inside to the point where they meet on the outside and just trim that off and then lift up this bit of sticker, and again, get rid of it. There we go, we've got all the way around the edge, we have our new wrap for our new game. The other way we can do this is with a machine such as this. This is the the Xyron Creative Station. There's actually another model that's been released since this one. And the upside of this is that it's very easy. It's not quite so fiddly as the spray glue method. And the results, I think, are a little bit better most of the time. The glue it uses is, is really good. The downside is that the cartridges for it, which is this thing with two rolls, one of backing paper, one of 
this case laminate and glue, are pretty expensive. And we have our, our back on some peel back sticker paper. I'm just going to trim this down to the crop marks that I previously made because this is the fit for the box. And remember, because we've got a good you know, five or six millimeter border all the way around on the back here from folding the side flaps in, this doesn't need to be absolutely precise. If you're going to vie away from the, um, the crop marks at all, then cut it a little bit smaller than necessary because like that, when you stick it down, it won't have any catch around the edges. If it were larger than the box, then it would potentially catch people's fingers. Now this is the right size to be stuck onto there. Double check. If it is too big, then trim it down a little bit more. It isn't. This one's fine. Peel up one end. Position it and then see it out. At this point, if your box is in any way non-symmetrical, make sure that you've got this the right way up because you're not going to get it back, down, back off again after you've stuck it down. This one isn't, so I don't need to worry too much. Center it. Make sure it's positioned correctly. Dab it into position. And peel back the backing as you smooth it down. We have it. We've got our, our box back, our box lid. We can put them together to make this something that's only a few company logos and awards or whatever away from a commercial game box. One relatively easy way to make a, a sturdier box for your games is to use foam core. And this is a sheet, as the name suggests, with a core of plastic foam and then a card facing on either side. And you can buy it in different colours. Black is a, a common favourite. You can also get it in white fairly commonly and less commonly in various other colours. It's a little bit tricky to work with because you have to make sure that you use a very sharp knife. So before we start, I'm going to change out for a, a brand new knife on my craft knife here. And it doesn't really work very well with rotary cutters or any other cutter that pushes down. You need to slice through it to get a clean cut. But once you've worked out how to cut it, then it forms a, a pretty sturdy box. It's very lightweight, unlike heavy cardboard. It's pretty rigid and secure, and it will hold your pieces very nicely. So for this, you are going to need, as suggested, a, a sharp craft knife. We will need a long ruler because we need to cut through potentially long bits of, of foam core. I'm going to use a, a little tool which is either a rebate cutter or a rabbit cutter, depending on where you live. This essentially just slices a thin ledge off of one edge of the foam core so that you can make a nice 90 degree join much more easily, and we'll go into that later. For this I'll be making a new box for the Battlecon demo print and play. Um, Battlecon is a, a fighting game, a one versus one that tries to emulate Street Fighter or Guilty Gear or whatever. I'd like to make a nice foam core box where all of these bits all of these components fit a little bit better and they're easier to get to. So here's all my stuff. First thing we need to do is get it together in a, a rough semblance of how we want our box to be laid out and work out how large our box actually needs to be. So first of all I need to work out how I'm going to lay all this stuff out in the box. And the robot will need to go in there. So it's not that bad. It just needs to be a little bit taller, I think, than the original plastic box. Ultimately, if I like this game, then I'll go out and buy the, the commercial version, which comes with many more characters, so I won't need to worry about this box necessarily being expandable. So I need to measure this, and it's going to need to be about 190 millimeters long by probably the boards of the widest part, and that's 130, so we'll say 135 millimeters wide. And the bit that the plastic box didn't do very well was the height, so I'll just measure that. 
and it probably wants to be about 60 millimeters maybe maybe 65 65 millimeters tall just to make sure everything fits in and it's better to have a little bit of room extra on the inside than it is to just have everything jammed in because if it's jammed in it's going to pop the lid off so next we need to work out how much foam core we're actually going to need for this essentially when we're going to make a, a foam core box then it will be made with these thick foam core walls which butt up against each other in the corners so this length here needs to take into account both the internal dimension and also the thickness of the board. When we're working out how large our pieces need to be, we need to add on generally twice the thickness of the board because we're going to have a piece on each face. When you're making cuts in foam core, obviously you want to try and keep your, your knife at 90 degrees as much as possible, so straight down into the cut. The more that you bend it sideways, the more you end up with a bevel along that cut, and that's no good. The other thing you want to try and do is make multiple passes rather than trying to go all the way through in one cut. If you try and go all the way through in one cut, you're more likely to tear the foam core. So line your ruler up with the line that you've uh, previously marked out. Hold it down pretty firmly because you're going to need to make multiple passes and you want to make sure that the ruler doesn't move in between each pass. The first cut you're really just cutting through the, the card on top of the foam core. So do a fairly shallow cut. You're really just dragging the knife through the card to separate the top layer of card and leave the foam in, inside intact for the moment. Then we make another cut, which goes, you can rest your knife against the cutting mat at this point and just drag it through. And then you're cutting through most of the foam. And don't worry if you feel like you need to make more than one pass at this point without any extra pressure on the knife because you need to make sure that cut is as clean as possible. And then finally, once we're fairly confident we've got through all the foam core, we put a little bit more pressure down on the knife and we cut through the opposite bit of card on the far side of it of the cut. And then you have a fairly good separation. And if you have a look at the edge, it should be pretty clean. No burring or tearing. If you try and cut through foam core with a dull knife, that's when you'll get tearing and that will look terrible. So brand new blade and we get a much cleaner cut out of it. Obviously you want to keep your cuts as square as possible and that's where a cutting out with a grid can be helpful. I need the base of my box to be 10 millimeters longer and wider than I measured for the space that I want inside my box because the foam core is five millimeters thick. I'm doing all my layout here with just a mechanical pencil because it shows up particularly well against the black foam core. You may prefer a pen if you're using white foam core. Now you'll notice I've drawn this line a lot further down than it necessarily needs to be because I also need to make two sides for the box exactly the same width. So I'm using the same 200 measurement. gives me the measurements for the base and two of the sides of my box. Now I should be able to get the lid and the two other sides out of this piece so the first thing I'll do is actually just slice along at 200 millimeters all the way down just so I have a more manageable piece of foam core to work with. I'm just going to fit this around so that wherever possible keep the, the knife running on the waist side of my cut. There are specialist tools that you can buy for working with foam core if you don't feel particularly confident making these cuts entirely by hand. Obviously it adds to the expense but it means that you potentially get a, a nicer box at the end of it. I'm just going to check that they're still square because it's worth making sure that at this point before you get too far if you're not sure and if you don't have a a grid on your cutting mat to reference against one easy trick is just to measure the opposite diagonals of a rectangle so if I measure from this corner to this corner 
I find that I have 247 millimeters, and I should find that this diagonal is exactly the same, and it is. It's very easy to get the knife to pass through the foam core, so don't worry too much about force, you just need to slice it through. Okay, so now I have my base, my two long sides, my two short sides, and that's most of my box done. If you've got two bits of foam core and you want to make a nice 90 degree join, then one option is simply to hope that you made a nice 90 degree cut and glue them together like that, butted together. And this works quite a lot of the time, it works reasonably well. Because you'll have a, a 90 degree angle, if you have a base in there, then that will hold them at 90 degrees pretty well, and they'll, the glue will fill in the small gaps. However, if you want to make a, a neater and more precise 90 degree cut, then it's nice to have a rebate in one edge, and this is essentially you can buy tools such as this, which will literally, you just run them along the edge of the foam core. There's a razor blade held inside at a precise distance from the, the edge of the tool. So if I run this along the edge I want to join, it provides a nice cut. This cut slices through the top layer and some of the foam, but doesn't go all the way through. And then I can use the other side of the tool, which has another razor blade inside, but this time it's much closer to the, um, the fence of the tool. And then I run this along to just slice this, this section on the edge off. And then it pops away and you're left with this little ledge. I don't know how easily you can see that on the video. You're left with this little ledge, which you can then slot another bit of foam core into and it forms a nice 90 degree join. The bonus here essentially is you've got two gluing surfaces because you've got the the surface on the flat back of the card here and then you've got the the foam edge here and because you're putting glue on both those surfaces it will be a twice as strong a join essentially. The other nice thing about the rebate is that it holds the joint at a much closer to 90 degree angle more naturally because the tool will cut this edge at a perfect 90 degree angle already. And as an added bonus, it kind of covers up the edge of the foam. So rather than having an exposed edge, if you do a butt joint, if you use the rebate, then it covers it up with the edge of the other bit of foam core. So you've just got this tiny little gap down the edge there and it looks a lot neater. However, if you don't have one of these tools, it is possible to do the same thing just by hand. It's a little bit fiddly. We just need to measure five, cent five millimeters in because that's the width of our foam core. And draw a line five millimeters long from the edge. And that's the line we're going to cut our rebate along or our rabbit. And when we were talking about making clean cuts in the foam core, you'll remember we had first one cut to slice through the card, then another cut to slice through the foam core itself and then a third cut to slice through the far end of the card. And essentially we're just going to do half of that. So we'll keep our blade fairly shallow and just cut through the, the top layer of the card first. And again, you want to keep your knife as close to upright as possible. Don't tip it from side to side. So we've just cut through the card. Then we do another cut. Don't put any pressure on the knife because if you put any pressure on the knife, it will be more likely to cut through the card at the bottom layer. So just lightly stroke the knife over the top. It will pass through the foam core itself very easily, but not easily through the card. And once you've done that a couple of times, you should actually have a cut very similar to the cut that the rebate left. Now, cutting the back edge, which the rebate cutting tool does for us, is a lot trickier with a knife. So in actual fact, it's easier to just tear away at the top layer of the of the foam with your fingers and if I just show you what I'm doing here I'm picking the foam out with my fingernail and you can see that I've got the the back edge of the rebate there so I can start to pull the foam off of the f off of the base card you won't get 
quite so clean a joint like this but it is a lot stronger still than just doing a butt joint if you're willing to put in a few minutes of extra effort and the phone comes relatively easily away from the card it is possible if you're being careful to peel the card off of the foam core and then you can if you want to just be sure after you've got rid of all these bits you can just run the flat of your knife along that in a scraping motion to get rid of any extra bits of foam that are still stuck to the base there. And there you have a rebate very similar to the one cut with the tool and it does exactly the same job of joining neatly at a, an angle in the corner there. It will not necessarily be quite so precise because the tool does a very good job of cutting exactly 90 degrees in both sides and your, your hand cut rebate will only be as close to 90 degrees as you can carefully cut with your knife. But it is still a lot better than just having a butt joint. It still has the same effect of covering up the edge and it still adds an extra gluing surface to strengthen the joint. I'm just going to start off by running the rebate cutter around all of the faces of the base of the box because I need one join in each of these places here. And also at each corner here, I'm going to need a join. So I will run the rebate cutter down the, the height of my long sides. These ones won't actually need the rebates on at all in the end. So I'll just quickly do that and then we'll get to gluing it together. As you see, that made easy work of all of those cuts. And I now have all of my rebates ready to glue up. So I would definitely recommend one of these if you're going to do a lot of phone call boxes. Now, when it comes to gluing this together, depending on the glue you're using, you can potentially just put the glue in, stick the pieces together and leave it and it will be fine. As you can see, this stands fairly well together until you knock it. However, it's a good idea to reinforce your joints one way or another because it makes for a more secure joint. It makes sure that the two pieces don't move while waiting for the glue to dry. And we will discuss a couple of different ways of reinforcing your joints while they're drying. I'm going to be using this particular glue. This is Aline's original tacky glue. This is apparently America's favorite craft glue, but I have absolutely no way of verifying that claim. So I'm going to assume they're lying. Because this is particularly thick, I find it useful to use a little desk tidy, stand the glue in it upside down like this, with the cap on obviously. And this makes sure that it's all already all in the cap. I don't have to sit there shaking it in order to get the glue out. Depending on your glue, you may or may not have to do something like this. What we're going to do is we're going to work our way around the box and glue one side in at once. So we will first line up and glue in one of our long sides. And then we'll use the, the L-shaped 90 degree reference we've got now to glue one of our shorter sides in. Then we'll go around, glue another long side onto that L-shape like that each side that we glue on is reinforcing the one that we just glued and it will keep our box more stable while we're actually gluing it together. The first way we can try reinforcing it is masking tape and this is the method I prefer. So for this we just take a couple of lengths of masking tape and stick them down to the, the side of the join that the rebate is cut into. And this is relatively important because you don't want to crush that rebate later on by pressing down to stick the other half of the masking tape on. So we stick it down fairly well to this side and then essentially we're going to put our glue in, put the thing together and then stretch that masking tape up and stick it to the back side to keep the, the joint together. And this works pretty well. Masking tape is a little bit stretchy. So it allows us to hold the glue fairly strongly we simply run a bead of our glue down right into the corner there. You don't need a huge amount, but you also don't want to skimp on it because if there's not enough glue in the join, then it also will not stay together. And if you've been using a rebate cutter, then you'll have all these little bits of foam core stick left around, which is actually really good for smoothing the glue into the corners. If you don't, then a little bit of card will work just as well for this. You want to make sure you don't have any built up along the edges. It might be worth running your finger along just to make sure that you don't end up with glue squeezing out onto the sides. And then once you've got your glue fairly neatly applied, you'll learn with practice how much you need to leave in before it squeezes out. Hold your other piece into place 
And then now we're holding this together, we stretch the masking tape around, stick it down, and that will hold the glue joint together well enough for it to solidify pretty well. An alternate method if you don't use masking tape is dressmaker's pins. And this is a favorite of a lot of people. And some people even just leave the pins in after they've glued the joint together. I'm not gonna do that. I'll make a joint with a dressmaking pin so you can see how it's done, but I prefer to take them out afterwards. I don't like the sort of riveted look that they give. And also, you know, I only have so many dressmaker's pins. Sometimes I need to make dresses. So in this case, we simply glue the whole joint together and stab the pins in through the edges of the joint afterwards in order to keep it all in place. So same deal with the glue. We just need to run a bead down the inside of this join. And because we're joining two faces this time, we need to glue both of them at the same time. Take our smearing stick and then place our end panel in place. And then this time, because we're using the pins, what we need to do is take a couple of pins for each side and push them through the end of the, the card where we've made our rebate and straight into the foam core. So I'm literally just pushing that in. I'm sighting down the top to make sure that it's not going to come out the, the side on the inside. I'm just pushing it and it fits into the foam core pretty easily. You can leave it a little bit stuck out if you want to make sure you can get it out again later because just having the pin in there in the first place will hold it well enough for the glue to dry. If you want to keep it in there, it's a good idea to push it all the way in at this point to make sure that the pin is effectively glued into position as well as the, as well as the foam core. And two per face in my experience is perfectly fine. You only need to hold it while the glue dries after all. And then we'll just work our way around the, the box. When you get to a place like this, you've essentially, you've got your, your L shape you're going to glue onto. We need to put one bead of glue on this piece and then one bead of glue on this piece because it's always easiest to apply the glue inside that groove. I left it the wrong way up. This is why you keep it upside down. When you do a corner like this, it's always worth pushing down at the top just to make sure that the two sides are flush with each other before you secure it with whatever reinforcement method you're using. Because otherwise you'll end up with a little step at the top there and that's no good either. Similarly, along the long ends in particular, sometimes you'll find that it bows out a bit, so it's worth pulling it together and pushing down on it to make sure that it's as securely in place as it can be before pushing in the pins. And you may, for longer pieces, need an extra pin in the middle just to eliminate any bow. And then our last piece I'll do with masking tape again, because that's actually my preferred method anyway. On this final edge, we're actually going to have three glue faces because we've got this U shape left. So we need to apply the masking tape to all of them and we'll need to apply glue to all of them. But same deal as before, just all the way around the inside of these rebates or rabbits, depending on which you prefer. I'm just wiping the excess glue off on this bit of note paper. Same process as before, just stretch the masking tape around the ends here. And there's our box. Now, when your box is all dried up and it's time to remove the masking tape, you don't want to just rip it off. Now we're using masking tape in the first place because it comes off a lot more easily than most other kinds of tape. So we can just, you know, gently peel it back. It's best to pull it away from relatively flat, away from the bit that is sticking up, because like that, you're not tearing upwards, which means that if you, if you pull it up like that, there's always the chance that you might lift off the, the cardboard face a bit, tear it. Whereas if you put it backwards like this, you're fairly safe. However, it's worth remembering when you get to this side, when you're pulling away from here, you don't want to pull any further away from the corner because then you are pulling 90 degrees away and you might lift up this face and pull it away from that foam core. So generally you want to work your way from to the edge from both sides. So I'll pull this one back just until I get to the edge there and then I'll pull this one back and I'll end up with the masking tape just adhered right on the edge there and I can pull it away safely. Now, you probably don't have to be that careful about it, to be honest, because masking tape doesn't have a great deal of stick. 
but if you want to be absolutely certain that you won't damage your box as you are removing the masking tape, that's a good technique. In case you're worried about the pin marks, once you've taken everything out, you can really barely see them. So, this is really only half a box. So we've got a tray, really. We can fit all of our game components in it, but it doesn't have a lid. We did keep a bit of foam core earlier, which is going to be our lid. And essentially, there's many different ways you can put a top on this. In this particular case, I'm just going to make a fairly loose top. I will cut my bit of foam core here, a rebate all the way around the outside edge, and just slide it in there. And that's going to work fine, so long as you are fairly tight with your rebates. And because I'm using the tool, I can be sure that I'm gonna get a fairly consistent rebate edge width, and I'm not gonna have any problems. If you're not so confident about that, you might want instead to make a, a thin card telescoping box, half of one, similar, say, to the ones in the small box video previously to this one. You may want to make half of a thick card telescoping box and just not bother making an entire thick card telescoping box. And there'll be one of those at the end of this video. You just need to make a lid one way or another, essentially. I saw a quite ingenious one the other day where a sheet of cardstock had been folded around three sides and glued together at the corners to make a nice sort of half of a telescoping box lid. And then the, the last flap had actually been glued down to the end of the foam core so that you could hinge it up and lift open the box like that and get at your game, which looked pretty cool. But for this one, I'm just going to trim this down to the right size and then I'll put a rebate all the way around and that will be my box for this case. One thing to bear in mind when you're doing this is that because if you look very closely at one of these rebated edges, there's actually a little tiny bit of foam still in there. So you may well find that while this dimension, where we butted our, our two end pieces inside the rebate, is actually still the original dimension that you cut. So this is 200 millimeters, which means there's 190 millimeters on the inside there, which is what I was after. This side, this way, is actually ever so slightly larger. So rather than the Rather than the 145 millimeters I cut, it's actually now 146 millimeters wide. So the inside here, rather than being the 135 I expected, is actually 136. So that's fine, there's a little bit of extra slop on the inside to keep my pieces, but it does mean that when I trim the piece for my lid, I don't want to trim it to 145, I want to trim it to 146, otherwise it'll be a little bit loose. So this board is now exactly the right size in both dimensions to fit on top of my box here and become a lid. And the simplest way to do it is simply to cut a rebate all the way around with the same rebate tool we used before. And now we have that rebate on, we can flip it over and this will fit neatly inside the end of our box. And that forms a pretty good lid. Now the problem with this, that's, that's a good secure box and you can keep your game pieces in it and they'll probably stick in fairly well. The problem with this is that the foam edge, the, the card edge here, is not actually that strong. So to make sure that doesn't bend and scuff up at the corners, I'm going to reinforce it with a bit of this fairly thick art card. This is 480 GSM. It's pretty, um, pretty sturdy stuff. So I'm just going to trim a bit of that, which is also 146 by 200 millimeters, and adhere it to this. So now I have a bit of this, which is just the right size to make a lid for the top of this. There are many different ways you can do this. I'm going to use spray glue. So essentially I will take a length of masking tape, stick it down to the inside of this rebate, and this is going to become a hinge. So I stick the masking tape down onto the edge of that rebate. I position my bit of card here in exactly the right place so that it's lined up with all of the edges. And then I fold this masking tape over the top again, stretching it a little bit so that it's perfectly in place and stick it down and like that I should be able to lift it open spray glue the inside and then just fold it flat 
and rub it down. Okay, I've got the glue on there now. I can just fold this back together. I do need to just you know, make sure that it's not completely misaligned. Obviously I can now pull the masking tape off. I no longer need the hinge. And there's our lid. There we go. And I can take my glue together box, drop the lid on top, pop it into place, and that's gonna hold my game components pretty well. And then I can just lift it up with the fingernail edge because I've now got this good, solid, thick bit of card on there. So let's stuff everything in. That all fits pretty well. Pop the lid on. And I'm just going to take my corner rounder here and just round off the corners of this so that they are slightly neater and also to prevent there being any chance of them catching and tearing away the card from the top here. At the moment it's just a plain black box, but it's fairly easy to just get some printed out labels and decorate this. There we go. One fairly nicely decorated print and play game box. I've got the, the game logo on two of the sides, and the nice front cover image, and you just pop up this lid, and there's all your pieces. And when I do finally give in and buy the large box commercial edition of Devastation of Indians, as opposed to just playing the demo, then I will be quite happy to pass this box along, along with its contents, to a fellow gamer and see if they like the system too. So, I'm going to make a box for Q4, and I've arranged all of the pieces of the game, all of the boards and the bags of components and the draw bag and everything, there's a deck of cards or two down there into a neat little block because this is essentially how large I need to make my game box. I could make another box this size, but as you can see, it's a little bit larger than it needs to be. So I want to avoid wasting any space and I'll make a box which is exactly the right size for this block of stuff. I have to add an extra four millimeters onto each of those dimensions in order to account for the thickness of the cardboard. And it's easiest if I just add an extra five millimeters on because it makes a nice round number. So 260 millimeters by 175 millimeters by 65 millimeters in total. So our box is 175 millimeters wide plus two lots of 65. So that's 305 millimeters in total. It's 260 millimeters this way, plus again another 130 for the, the two sides. 390. Of course, we also need to cut out the, the squares for the corners. So we need 65 millimeters in from each direction. And there we have the layout for our bottom box. Now this bit 
and this bit, and this bit. These are all gaps because we're going to fold those up to form the sides of the box. So we'll cut those out in there. So make sure the entire bit of cardboard is actually on your cutting mat, otherwise you will mar up the top of your surface and you will not be a very popular person. The challenging part of making a box like this is that we now need to cut a bevel along each of these. And at this point, we basically need to cut a, a V groove along here. So a 45 degree cut there and a 45 degree cut facing it that center along that line that we've already got there. And this is not something which is amazingly straightforward to do, unfortunately. The most straightforward is by using a tool such as this, which is a, a mounting board cutter or a mat cutter, depending on whether you're American or not. And this is, it cuts a 45 degree angle. It's got a, a blade sticking out the front. I've actually modified this one so that it's got a front fence so that I can run it along a ruler. And I'll put a video up separately of how to construct that front fence, how to measure it and get it right. And that's specifically for trying to cut v-grooves for board game boxes. However, these things are cheap and rubbish and they still don't work very well. If you have access to a professional mount cutter or mat cutter, um, the ones I've seen used in framing shops are generally by the company Logan, then that will probably be your best bet. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're going to have to learn to cut a 45 degree angle by hand by placing your ruler next to the cut you need to make and running your knife along it at an angle. The good news is it doesn't have to be perfectly 45 degrees. Um, the bad news is that the more you mess it up, the more greyboard you go through. So I need to lay my ruler along the line that I've drawn, which is going to be the edge of my, my box, the corner where it stops going along and starts going up. And I want to put my, my 45 degree cutter down and just slide the blade forward until it dives a little way into the cardboard. And then picking it up again, I'm going to run it along, keeping my finger pressed down on this blade carriage to try and stop it deflecting as much as possible. And I'm just scoring the top of the cardboard slightly at this point. Then I extend it all the way, make sure there's no fluff on it because unfortunately it half cuts, half tears, and then push it down the ruler, same line, same pressure on the blade, this time cutting nearly all the way through the, the grey board, right to the end, and then remove the fluff, retract the blade. And then I need to, and at this point I have a one half of my 45 degree V cut, so I need to flip the card around, place the ruler down exactly the same line because the whole point of this procedure is that we we have our cut centered along that line and then I'm going to do exactly the same process but because cutting through cardboard makes this quite blunt very quickly and I've already cut two cuts in this direction I'm now going to cut the other one in reverse, essentially, so I'll pull it towards me. Same procedure, I'm just using the other half of the blade. So I will lay my ruler in position, stab the tip of the blade just into the surface of the cardboard there, draw it back to do my initial scoring cut, pull off the fluff very carefully so I don't cut myself, and then push the blade all the way out and bring it back along the same line cutting full depth and now we should be able to just yeah, there you go, pop out that V sweep away all of the debris that's been torn out rather than cut and it has left us with a fairly good V groove so here's the edge, and you can see that it's it's got a central line, and 
trust me, that is roughly where my pencil line was in the first place. We have a 45 degree angle on this side and a 45 degree angle on that side. And obviously the intent here is that we can fold that up and it will bend along that line and form a nice 90 degree once it comes together. Realistically, that's not going to happen and we'll go into why later. But it's a good start towards making a sturdy box. Now we just need to do that three more times. The downside is that this is the blade that I used to make that cut. I've taken it out and it is already getting a bit dull. So if I take a, a scrap bit of cardboard here and I try cutting up here, I get a fairly good slice into the card. If I try cutting down here, it's much harder to get into the card and it tears because just from that small amount of cutting, I've already dulled the tip of the blade in the last um, three or four millimeters there where it actually cut into the card. So I need to sharpen it. And because it's such a tiny blade and it's made out of such rubbish steel, that's actually a pain in the ass. The first step is I'm going to take a, a Sharpie, any old marker will do, and I'm just going to draw all over the bevel of the blade with it. Because like this, I can see which bits I've already ground away with the sharpening tool and which bits I haven't. And essentially I just need to make sure that I re-grind the very edge to be sharp again. I'm using a tool like this. This is a, a diamond covered rod. It's round on one side, flat on the other. I'm just using it to grind away that cutting edge as much as I can, as neatly as I can. I'm trying to keep the flat of the tool roughly at the same angle as the bevel and I'm using the the black of the sharpie there to help me decide when I've done that. Um, it doesn't seem to me to make much difference whether I do it in round circles or just with a, a stroking motion. But one way or another I want to grind away at least the sharpie on the front there and I need to keep my my tool as as close to flat as possible to do that because the more I cut at that, you know, the, the more steep the angle that I grind it at, the more I'm actually going to be blunting the blade rather than sharpening it. The point is to get this to as as acute an angle as possible between the this face and this face. So now I just do this on the other side as well, because I'm going to use that as well. Same procedure. Try not to damage this side while I do it. And realistically, we don't need to sharpen the entire thing. It's only the last six millimeters or so at this end that actually gets used. Lastly, we flip it over. And we just have a few strokes across the back because this will have curled a slight burr up on this face. So if we just run along the back just a couple of times, just to make sure that burr is taken off, then that is as sharp as we're going to get that tool. So the alternate way of doing it is with a craft knife. And the problem with using a craft knife is that it's very hard to actually measure exactly where you're going to put this cut. So before I start on a craft knife edge, I'm first going to use the knife to just make a tick, just cut right the way through the card where the line is at both ends. And that means that after I'm done, no matter how well my bevel went, I've definitely got that reference mark there to actually cut these side bits off and make sure they're the right height and width. So the tricky part when using a, a craft knife is that your ruler will be raised off the table and you're going to be resting it against the ruler. So there's some geometry to do essentially. So first of all we take another ruler and we measure how high off the table our first ruler is. And this one sits two millimeters off the table. My card stock is two millimeters thick. So I need the, the point that the knife enters the card to be two millimeters back from the, the line I need it to cut up to. Because that needs to be two millimeters back, my ruler, which is also two millimeters tall, needs to be two millimeters further back from that. So I need to make a mark four millimeters either side of the line. And that's where my ruler will be lined up against. So I will lay my my ruler down at that four millimeter mark and then if I hold my knife at a 45 degree angle then two millimeters up and two millimeters across it will hit 
the card at the two millimeter mark that I need to actually have my 40, 45 angle starting at and then hit the bottom at the of course the problem is I can't hold my knife at a precisely 45 degree angle so I just have to I wouldn't like to say guess but you know it's a matter of being used to it so run your knife very lightly do several passes for this because you're never going to go all the way through and also hold an accurate angle all the way down Realistically, as long as your angle is consistent, it doesn't matter whether it's exactly 45 degrees. Being consistent is better than being completely accurate, because that leads to a smooth cut, and a smooth cut leads to a smooth join between the two bits of card. And also, don't worry if you do manage to go all the way through, because we're going to be separating these out anyway. And we're going to have to fix them together later to make our sturdy box sturdy. And again, I can use the two millimeter ticks I made on the card as a guide for what angle to hold the blade. You can see this is starting to lift away. So there you go. It's cut all the way down. The next step is to turn this into a box. And at the very least, we need to remove these four corners. Personally, I recommend removing all five parts, separating all five parts out from each other because I find that if I just fold over the edge it will tear and crumple and not look very good. So I'll demonstrate with one of them. This one's already got a cut part way down it so folding over should be easier. It will go to a certain point but then you'll start to see tears. If you can get away with folding like this, then that's great because it adds a little bit of extra strength to your corner. But as you can see when I put it back, it's torn the face of the card a little bit all the way along in an uneven pattern. So if you can get away with bending all four sides up, then that's great. If you can't, don't worry about it because we're going to reinforce these joints anyway. So at the very least, we want to take our knife, and it is easier to do with a knife, and cut out the corner pieces the squares at the ends that we just don't want at all. These are a complete waste and we're going to get rid of them. At this point if you can see any particular fluff on one or two of your cuts then you might want to take the opportunity to clean up that bevel a little bit. Now we flip it over and we need to reinforce these joints because some of them will actually have pulled themselves apart, some of them will have been partly cut through already like this one just happened while we were cutting the groove and a great material for reinforcing the backs of these joins is um, gum tape and this is used on picture framing to seal in the back of the picture to prevent bugs and so on from getting inside the picture frame underneath the glass and essentially it forms a hinge like this so this is the gum tape and it's really strong. This is just a test I did earlier on with a bevel on the inside. I can't pull that apart. This is I'm actually pulling really hard on this. Um, it doesn't lift up easily, even though it's just held on with gum. So we're going to use this to tape up these four joins just to make sure that they are nice and secure and also to tape around these corners to secure them for the first time. This is the brand that we have in the UK, gum strip sealing tape. There's possibly others by Butterfly. Uh, this one, as you can see, cost me nearly three whole pounds, which is not that much for something which is so cool. Pulls out in the middle, presumably because otherwise it would never stay together. And you literally just want to roll out enough to cover one of these edges. Cut it with scissors. It's just like brown paper at this point. Moist in the back. And you can do this by licking it or by having a little dish of water or whatever. And then once it's moist, just stick it down into place and smooth it down as if it were a, a bit of label or whatever. And then this is the important part. We then need to bend the fold into a 90 degree because it might be the case 
that along that join the tape has to stretch a bit or pull out of position a bit in order to hold that 90 degrees. So then we just need to repeat it and you can see there's a little ridge formed by the fact that it had to, had to stretch around that joint. And we need to make sure that it dries in the right position for the 90 degrees, not for the right position for the flats, because otherwise it might prevent us from folding or tear when we do fold. So we just repeat the same process for all four sides. And if you do lick this, then you will be utterly disgusted a bit by the end of it, because it tastes pretty foul in the first place. Same procedure all the way around. Put the tape on, bend it up to 90 degrees just to make sure that it's in the right position. And then smooth it out on the back to make sure it's stuck down properly. And this stuff's actually quite thin, so it will lay over the top of itself at the corners without causing too much trouble. For the last one we'll do a demonstration, just in case any of yours did come off, either by cutting too zealously or when you folded them, I'll just cut through this one to show you that even if it's completely separated you can still tape it on with this gum tape and it's just as strong. There we go. And it's just the tape holding that on now. So now we've got all of our sides up at taped 90 degrees, we just need to put a little bit of extra tape around each corner to hold them together at the corners. About three or four centimeters, one and a half to two inches on each side. And then we'll just lift up the sides, put the corner into place, and smooth the tape around it. And then just work your way around the box, do one corner at a time. And then we have a pretty solid box, even before the tape has properly dried off. So, the next step is to wrap this. So, this is obviously wider than your average piece of A4 paper, or letter paper. So, there's no way we can actually do a whole wrap for this on one sheet. And instead of that, we're going to abandon the idea of printing out the graphics for every single side. I mean, you could print out the graphics for this side, and then the graphics for this side, and then the graphics for this side, similar to what we did with the Dark Star box. But, you know, sooner or later you'll still eventually need to build a box which is so large that you can't even do that. So instead, we're going to use gift wrap. First of all, we just want to make sure that we get a bit which is large enough, but not too large. So we want to hold it as far from the end of the roll to make sure we've got a couple of centimetres there just so that we can fold it inside once we're done. And then we tip the entire box up and make another mark a couple of centimetres from this face. Just so that we, we know that we've definitely got enough there to wrap the entire box. Then we just need to make a cut all the way along the, um, the gift wrap here. And none of this needs to be especially accurate because we're going to cut off a lot of this by the time we actually finish. Now we do the same thing in the other direction. Now, gift wrap tends to roll up, so obviously it's not the easiest thing to spray glue the inside off. And we need to make sure that once we do spray glue the inside, it's not going to roll up so much that the glue touches itself and sticks to itself. There's probably several ways to do this, but the way I'm used to doing it is to take a plastic lid, and this is around about the same size as the base of your box. Realistically, it just needs to be large enough to stop the paper rolling up again. And then I've got this temporary adhesive. This stuff is, is a kind of temporary glue, which will... You've probably seen it before, kind of gummy stuff that balls up if you rub it. And I'm just going to put a dab at each corner. Realistically, it doesn't matter what you use so long as it doesn't damage the surface of the gift wrap because the side that I'm going to glue down to the top of this is the side that will be seen after we've finished our box. So I just flatten it out, dab it down onto those, those spots of the temporary glue, 
and that will hold it open enough to spray glue the inside and then come back and we can stick it to the box. So this is now tacky with glue so I can drop this and again as long as it's near enough the centre to not fail to come up all of the sides, as long as it reaches far enough each of the sides to get wrapped inside it doesn't matter whether we're exactly centred here so I can do this by eye. I'm just holding this up at the back here to make sure that I've got enough gap here to wrap it around and get a fairly good idea of where the middle was. And then I'm just going to drop this down onto the middle and turn the entire thing over so that I can take off my, my temporary stand. As you can see, none of the uh, bits of temporary glue came with it. And then smooth down the gift wrap over the, the bottom of the box. Because there's glue all the way over the bottom of the gift wrap, they should now stay in place quite well. And then we've flipped the entire box, we can move on to the next stage. We need to move relatively fast. What we need to do is cut away from the corner, roughly in line with you can just drop your ruler down on the side, which will mean it's hard to get it to stick to the spray glue. What you want to do, essentially, is cut along, away from the corner, in the direction of the short edge. If I just run my knife along the side of the ruler there, do this on all four corners, because what we're doing, essentially, is we're forming out of the spray glued gift wrap, we're forming a similar pattern to the one that we had with the printed wrap that we used for Dark Star earlier. So now we've got this far, do not allow these to actually touch up here, that's the bit we need to be careful of. Cut an ever so slight bevel, so an angle off there, in here. Unfortunately it's not easy to get a ruler in there. If you do have a very small, thin ruler. You can possibly do the same thing that we did before, but be careful to only lay it down on edge like this. If you lay it all the way down, then obviously the spray glue will stick to it. So now we can fold this side up, the short side, and often it's actually easier to tip the box down onto it because you've got a nice solid flat surface underneath it. Drop the box down neatly, and then you can flip it over and rub the paper down onto that flat side. And then fold the side flaps around. And then again, tip it down onto the, the long side. Smooth that up. The important thing to remember is to smooth up from the edge, because otherwise you might end up, there we go, we've got a little bit of a crease underneath the edge. The spray glue will allow you to reposition it for the first you know, five or ten minutes, but after that it will be pretty solid and you'll never get it unstuck, so make sure you get rid of these creases now while you still have the chance. And that should have formed a fairly neat corner on each corner, just make sure to press that down so as to avoid any future problems. And the only issue now is to just how to wrap this onto the inside. So what I prefer is to take my box, stick the knife right into the corner there, and then cut out just an ever so slight triangle. And again, do this on each corner. And then you simply tuck these inside and run them all the way down. And if you do get a little bit of wrap around the corner there, that's best, because that means that you've definitely got that corner covered with your, your gift paper. If you're worried about stuff like this, and you want to just trim it off to neaten up the, the edge on the inside of the box, then take the opportunity to do so. Again, it's best if you can either freehand it or lay the ruler on its edge to cut along. And there we have one half of box. It's good and secure. It's fairly attractive. It would be nicer if it had game graphics all the way down the side, but obviously you can get your label and stick it on the outside of that fairly easily after the fact. 
you can dress this just the same as you dress any other thing. So take a, uh, a nice rectangular label with a description of your game, stick it on the back there. And then we just need to make another one of these, which is exactly the same, just ever so slightly larger. Now we've made this one, it's a good idea to measure it and use those measurements for the next box. So I intended to make this one, let's check, 175 millimeters wide on the inside. And the outside is now 177 millimeters. Let's check it's the same at both ends. Yep, yeah, 177. So if I try and make the inside of my upper half 178, that should fit in nicely. And once we put the rules in, put the lid on, we'll be done. I managed to completely lose the footage of finishing off this box, but here's a couple of photos. Here's what the box looks like when it's closed. I deliberately made the top, the lid, a little bit shorter than the base so that there'd be a, a lip all the way around that I could more easily grab the lid and take it off with. And here's the open box containing all of the parts for the game. So there you go, three different ways to make large game boxes for your print and play games. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask below in the comments. And good luck, I hope all this works out well for you, and I'll see you next time.